All right, let's open our Bibles to John 20, 24, as we continue our study through John. And this morning we will end chapter 20 and really begin the final portion of John's message, which focuses specifically upon Thomas and Peter. You know, I think we told you as we were going through John early on that, that Jesus, his encounter with personal, with uh, individuals, personally with individuals, is one of John's kind of hallmarks. He, he takes individuals and he shows us how the Lord reacts and interacts with them. And so we're going to have the Lord have a discussion with Thomas today and Peter next week, and then we're going to end after Easter, on the Sunday after Easter, Lord be willing, with, with Jesus literally saying to Peter, mind your own business because he wanted to know stuff about other people. So that'll kind of end it for us. We, we are going to look at the restoration of Peter. We're going to continue on through our study in John next Sunday morning on Easter because it just fits right in there. Peter was a failure and the, the cross made him, uh, you know, saved him and then the resurrection enabled him to be a success. So we're going to look at that next week. But uh, today we want to look at Thomas. And you all know Thomas. And we've entitled the message, What Are You Going to Do With Your Doubts? Someone once described a pessimist as a person who's always seasick on life's voyage. And I thought I liked that. That was a pretty apt description. There's always something going on, right? I heard a guy say a while back, I'm not an optimist, but I hope to be one one day. And I went, really? That doesn't work. Did you all hear the story about the, the farmer, the optimistic farmer who lived next to the very pessimistic farmer? And, and they were forever having discussions over the, the fence. And you know, the optimistic farmer would say, well, it's a beautiful day today. And the... The other fellow would say, yeah, you probably scorched the crops, you know. And, or when the rain came, wasn't God's good? He gave us rain, you know, and yeah, we're probably flood out. And so the optimistic farmer thought he'd take the guy duck hunting, and he put him in a boat with him. He said, well, let's go duck hunting. You know, hang out with you. Maybe you can change your attitude. And the ducks came flying by, and they shot a duck and fell into the water, and he said to his dog, who was in fight, go get, the, go get the duck. And the dog just walked right on the water. Got the duck, walked it back in. He said, what do you think about that? He goes, oh, your dog can't swim, can't he? <laughs> I thought, all right, there's no hope for this guy. <clears throat> I guess that's kind of like Thomas. He's from Missouri. Thomas was from Missouri, the show-me state. But in honor of him, we refer to skeptical people as doubting Thomases, don't we, to this day. And I guess there's some reliability to that, a rationale for that, because every time you do see Thomas in the scriptures, he is a kind of a dark guy. You know, he looks at kind of the glass is always kind of half empty for, thin, for him, and, and he always just kind of, he's a fatalistic kind of guy. It doesn't make him unloyal, though, and, and it certainly doesn't make him an unhesitant follower of Jesus, but he's a pretty pragmatic guy in, in, in his outlook for things. And so we, I think we can learn from him how to deal with our doubt because he will arrive eight days later where all of the other disciples, at least those in the upper room, arrived the week before. And that is when they saw the Lord and they recognized you know, that he wasn't dead, he was alive and had risen, their sadness and despondency became very joyful and hopeful and confident. So we're just going to look at these few verses down through the end of the chapter, but with, with particular interest in... You know, how do we deal with our doubts? Beginning in verse 25 with these words, Now Thomas, called the twin, was one of the twelve, but he was not with them when Jesus came. Speaking about the Easter evening that we read about last week. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Here's your first point to consider when it comes to doubt. You should be honest about your doubts and your questions, but in the process of trying to get answers, don't isolate yourself from others. Now, we finished last week with John looking at Easter Sunday evening, and, and we looked at the 120 or so of the saints who were there. They'd locked the doors. They were terrified that they were going to be next. They had heard reports, scattered reports of Jesus' resurrection all day. But they had discounted all of them. Mary Magdalene, well, she's a pretty emotional girl. And Peter came running in, well, he's a pretty emotional guy. And, and somehow everyone had kind of set it aside so that by the time that Jesus appeared last week, it frightened, it terrified them. But by the time they were sure that it was him, great things began to happen. They were filled with joy. They were glad. They were 
told that there would now be peace with God and from God for them. They would be saved. He breathed on them the Holy Spirit. They had their understanding opened where they could understand the scriptures. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, before Pentecost, you will find this group of people to gather together in one accord. That didn't happen before. They were always arguing. But now the Lord's Spirit had been poured out into their hearts. And he gave them a, a, a commission, right? He gave them a purpose to preach the gospel to others. He, he gave them his spirit to dwell within them. But he also said, wait until you receive power from on high. You need the empowering gift of the Holy Spirit upon your life to go out and to serve. Well, all of that took place last week. And the problem was Thomas hadn't showed up. Because to him, his pragmatic outlook concluded, this is ridiculous, it's over. Thomas, like I said, was a, a, a guy that kind of looked at life differently than most. A few months earlier, you might remember in John 11, the, the messenger had come from Mary and Martha's house that Lazarus was sick. And they were quite a ways away, together down by the Jordan River, and, and Jesus waited for a while to leave, and then he said to his disciples, well, let's go up to Judea again. And all of the disciples collectively said, well, Lord, that's, that's a terrible idea. Lately, they've been trying to stone you there. You can't go back there. And there was a little discussion amongst the disciples, and eight verses later, John 11, it is Thomas who said, well, all right, then let's just go and die with him. All right, I agree, it's a somber guy. He's not your optimist, but that's pretty loyal, isn't it? How many folks are going to go, I'll go with you to die? <laughs> I think most of your friends at that point go, yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> Just leave a forwarding address, you know, I, wherever you're going to end up. A, a few days earlier at the, at the Last Supper, Jesus said to his group, in fact, it was, what, 11 days earlier now, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. My, in my Father's house there are, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I'm going to go prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you might be also. And then Jesus said this, where I go you know, and the way you know. And Thomas went, yeah, no. Time out. Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how am I supposed to know the way? Thomas was never shy about voicing his feelings or his understanding. He was very rational in his outlook. He was cut and dry in his evaluations. He was brutally honest with how he felt. Didn't make any apologies to anyone for it. But because of that outlook, to him the cross had effectively ended his hope. Jesus was dead. He'd watched him die. And his plans that he had entertained for over three years had died as well. It left him in great despair. Very disappointed, pretty despondent, but he's not making any apologies to you that he feels that way. And if he's going to go forward, he'd like to go forward on his own. And he does what sometimes people do in tragedy. They isolate themselves. Never good. But Thomas saw little need to gather with others. We have a pity party, crying each other's shoulders. It's not what Thomases do. I'm not coming. And while everyone came together in their grief to look for some mutual comfort and maybe some safety as well, Thomas hurts by himself. And while they were getting hourly reports of Jesus being alive, even if they discounted them, there was that, that hopefulness interjected into the group. Thomas was nowhere to be found. Now look, it's okay to have doubts. You, you know, it, it's part of growing up. Honest ones require honest answers. But you should never let doubt separate you from others. You know, being honest with your doubts is vital. Removing yourself from, from the group is, is destructive. We read last week in verses 19 and 20 that when Jesus showed up after <laughs> terrifying everyone, that, that the folks were really glad. And you could relate to that. He's alive. Woohoo! You know, they couldn't have been happier. Their, 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 their sorrow and their tears had been changed to joy in a moment's time. They saw his hands and his feet. In fact, they saw, according to verse 20, what Thomas demanded to see. You know, I know we, we set Thomas aside because he's kind of an example he's been made of. He, he's a week late, right, and a dollar short kind of guy. But no one really got through this without seeing. 
And, and, and in fact, notice what it says there. When they saw his hands and his side, they were glad. Thomas just go, oh, that's what I want to see. So he's not that far away from the rest of them, if you will. He, he doesn't really have much less faith. Thomas wasn't unique in his struggle to believe in God. The others weren't more faithful than Thomas. No one had believed Mary Magdalene when she showed up. Nobody had. Mark 16, I think, verse 14 says, when all the other women showed up and said, well, hey, we saw the Lord. They go, yeah, you guys, Mary's laying in the, down in the back. You go lay down with her, you know. They all just wrote it off as some kind of, you know, illogical kind of emotional response to a tough time. It wasn't until Jesus stood in their midst that their own eyes saw him that they believed. And, and, and Mark tells us when Jesus showed up that first Easter night that he had to get on him for their unbelief. How many people do I have to send to you before you listen? Guys are too much. <laughs> and then here, touch my hands. But what they were willing to do was gather together and in so doing, come to a place where they would meet with God and hear his voice and see his hand. Why do people skip church? I don't know. But I hear from people sometimes, I'll say, well, I haven't seen your church. Oh, I've been so down, or I'm out of work, I'm really discouraged, or I'm really going through it, and I'm thinking, that is not the time to skip church. You want to skip church, skip a week when you're doing great. Don't stay away too long. But you don't want to do it when you're falling apart. It's the worst time in the world to leave. And, and interestingly enough, if you read through the scriptures, most of the, of the time when God deals with people's doubts and questions and concerns, he deals with them in public places, in groups of people that have gathered, and that it's in the midst of the church, or in the midst of the body, or in the context of the saints, that those questions are answered. And, and that God comes to meet you and to show himself to you. Whatever the reason Thomas didn't come that first week, and we can guess, right? He, he suffered for a week longer than everybody else. Now look, Thomas's doubts needed answers. I get that. But faith was going to have to play an important part in this. And what God will require of them as he requires of us is faith based on solid evidence. Not, not just, you know, close your eyes and jump. Thomas, as well as the others, all needed a rational reason to believe. I get that too. Because my heart can't enjoy or rejoice in what my brain is, is, is deciding is false and impossible. And for Thomas, in, with all of his logic, the cross killed him. But it would be the empty tomb and the resurrection that would restore it. And, and here's the deal with Christianity as, a, as, a, as a, a religious, if you will, presentation to people. Christianity is always willing to appeal to the historical fact of the resurrection to call others to have a rational faith that Jesus is God and that he's Lord. And that's the difference. It, there's no leaping into the darkness with the hand over your eyes. It's leaping into the light, isn't it? That doesn't mean doubt isn't a, an issue in our life. It doesn't mean that, that we don't have questions that are good and that are necessary. In fact, when people doubt, I, think, I just think they're thinking. Well, I was thinking about this, and it kind of bothered me. What about that? That's good. I, I appreciate that. I think that's how you grow. But, but the end is to consider the evidence which brings you to a place of faith and commitment to Jesus and to his word. And I found over the years when people come in that have doubts, they usually are, are very narrow-minded in the fact that everything now runs along the line of that doubt. That's all they think about. Oh, I've had this deal. And now it becomes like... The, the one elephant in the room, you know? So I say this to them sometimes. Well, all right, let's be honest with your doubt. We get that. Let's be honest with some other things. What? About your lack of satisfaction in this world. What do you mean? Well, you're obviously running to church. You're not very happy in the world. Well, that's true. Okay, so let's put that on the table. And you're aware of your sin, aren't you? Yeah, well, we should consider that because God talks about that and the weakness that you have to overcome it, and, and your desire to be forgiven. And, and let's be honest, your flesh is not very helpful when it comes to your spiritual life. And that you will to do right, but if God doesn't help you, your will usually goes for ice cream and cake, and you're on a diet. So, so you need to confess those things too. That's what the Bible calls confession. Well, after that first Easter evening meeting, 
Thomas got visits apparently from a lot of people. The, the word that we read in, in the scriptures here is that they, they just went to tell him. The other disciples said to him, I don't know if 120 went and found him, or 50 knew where he was hiding, or 40 could get in the front door. I don't know, but I, knew, I, I know that he got it from every angle. You missed it, man. Dude, you should have been there. I'm pretty sure that's in there. Dude, you should have been there. Jesus showed up. I've got the Spirit living in me. i got the Spirit in me. They're probably singing now and smiling. And old Tom is just long in the face. Or, it was awesome, Thomas. Woo! Should have joined us. Told you. But in the face of, of, of 100 people, maybe, that had the potential to testify to him, and they were friends that he recognized and friends that he, that he depended upon, he could still fight with them with reason. I will not believe this until I have some tangible evidence. And he uses the word print, and the Greek word is tufos. And it means scar or imprint. In 1 Thessalonians, when Paul said to the, to the believers, you've been examples throughout Macedonia, the word examples is the word tufos. Your imprint of Jesus upon your life, everyone's been able to take notice of. That's what Thomas says. I want some physical evidence. I want to see the prints. So, not so obvious in the English is Thomas's response here because it's written in, in Greek in, the, in, in a double negative. No, not ever. It, it's, it's very emphatic, if you will, adamant about his position. I can't believe Jesus rose from the dead. I've got to see the evidence for myself. There has to be some other kind of explanation. It just doesn't compute with me. So, be honest about your doubts, but don't isolate yourself. And second of all, when it comes to doubt, be open to learn and to examine the evidence. Be willing to grow and get your questions answered. Be honest. Now we read in verse 26, after eight days, the disciples, Jesus's, were again inside. Thomas, this time, guess who showed up? Was with him. I don't know if they shamed him into it or what, but there he is. And Jesus came. This time the doors were shut. They weren't locked. <laughs> I think there's a different crowd waiting for him. And he stood in their midst and he said, now peace to you. And then he turns immediately to Thomas. And I, I suspect every eye in the room followed him. Thomas, bring your finger over here, buddy. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put them into my side. Thomas, don't be unbelieving. And the word is doubting. Don't be doubting. Be believing. Now, this was a tough week for Thomas. It was, it was a week where he argued with his friends, where his sadness and despair stood next to their joy and peace, where his disillusionment was constantly being challenged. His, he was a defiant guy. But somehow, through all of that hoping against hope, Thomas shows up next week at church. When the, when the body gathered, when the group came together to, to worship, to, to pray for one another, he was there. So regardless of what his mouth was saying, his heart was crying out, man, I hope you're right and I'm wrong. But I don't think so. But you see, he became teachable. He was willing to, to learn and to examine the evidence. That's important. And Jesus seems to arrive all the time the same way. He just pops in. I guess he doesn't like doors. I don't know. Maybe in the new life, no doors. I have no idea. He just pops in. Hey, guys, peace. Shalom. <laughs> Nice to see you. And then he immediately turns to Thomas. And I, I suspect everyone went, yep, we're waiting for this. Yeah, I told you, Thomas. Every eye went to the gentleman with a firm will. Now look, Jesus knew the condition of Thomas's heart. And even the conditions that Thomas had placed upon the acceptance of the reality of the resurrection. And, and so Jesus publicly invites Thomas to resolve that. It's not, usually not very wise to demand proofs from the Lord before you trust in him, but... God knows your heart, and God will meet you where you live if you're sincere, and I think Thomas was. But I want you to notice that besides the invitation to come and be sure were the words, don't be an unbeliever, don't be a doubter, Thomas, believe. Now, why would the Lord say that? Because Thomas had heard Jesus' resurrection from tons of witnesses. Thomas had been with Jesus for three and a half years and heard what he said, saw what he did. Thomas had plenty of reasons to be sure, plenty of proof, plenty of assurances. He had plenty to go on if he would have just taken what he had been taught and run with it 
But he was unwilling. Unwilling. So stop doubting. Thomas believed. Back in December of, not last year, what was that, 14? December of 2013, we were in John chapter 4. I know you all remember that like it was yesterday. <laughs> but there is a story there that kind of goes along with what Jesus said to Thomas here. And it was a story about Jesus showing up in Cana. Now he had just come from the woman at the well in Samaria. And man, that had gone well, hadn't it? She had come to him in faith. She'd brought the whole town in it, who'd asked him to stay for days. And there was a revival in Samaria. But then Jesus went north to Cana. And we are told there in, in John chapter 4 that the people that showed up showed up really just because of having been at the feast before and having seen him, they, they realized the, the, the miracles that he, they had done. And so they were there gathered together around Jesus in Galilee, but their hearts weren't there to learn of him or to believe in him. They were there to be entertained by him. And their hearts had little to do with their own sinfulness or his salvation that he had brought. They were just enamored by the fact that this was that Jesus that did all that cool stuff when we were at the feast last time in Jerusalem. They weren't looking for Christ, the Savior of the world. They were looking for Jesus, the miracle-working sideshow. And I told you when we went through that week that curiosity welcomed him to Cana, but soon unbelief would move him along to silence. Well, in Cana, we are told by John, came a basilicos, a a man of royalty from King Herod Antipas's uh, rank officer. He lived in Capernaum. It was 25 miles away. His son was dying, and he heard that Jesus was coming to Cana, and he thought, I've got to get him to my house. And so he took whatever transportation he, he would. If he walked, it would have taken the better part of a day. And his intention was very serious, and he was a genuine guy. As opposed to everyone who was there looking for miracles and signs, here came a man with real need looking to Jesus. And, and, and he was grief-stricken, and he was, he was desperate, and his boy was terminal. And so he came with one intention, persuade Jesus to come with me. It's a matter of life and death. In fact, you'll read in John 4 these words, he implored him to come with him. It's, a, it's an imperfect, indicative Greek verb. That's, that means he, he begged him. And then when he took another breath, he, he started all over again. He just didn't let up, as you would imagine some father would do for his son. So he was agitated. What's that? Jesus' response in, in chapter 4, verse 48, is almost, if you read it carefully, or not too carefully, sounds callous. Jesus said this, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. And you go, wow, Lord, back up. Seems a little harsh. Poor guy's in tears. But, but you have to go back and read it again a little bit because we re remember that most of the crowd were simply there out of curiosity. There was this amazement at the power and the signs and the wonders. The faith of the people in the crowd, by and large, was disingenuous. It was shallow at best. They wanted another miracle. They could have cared less about the message. They could have cared less about Jesus' mission. But yet in the crowd stands one man who sincerely wants his help. Now, Jesus reprimands the crowd, and he uses this man's genuine cry for help to address the ad attitude of the people standing around them in terms of their heart. He uses the word you, unless you, and then the word people is in um, italics, it's not in the original, but the you is plural, unless you all see signs and wonders, you'll in no wise believe. In other words, you've got to see to believe. You're always just looking to see more and to see more. You never get past the signs. They were wonders in the sense that they drew attention to the act. They were signs in the fact that they were supposed to point you to God who is in Christ. That's God in the flesh. But Jesus said to the crowds, you're always looking for more signs. You never get past the signs. Nicodemus said to Jesus when he came, nobody can do what you do unless God's with him. The signs brought him to Jesus. Question. In John chapter 6, the crowd who had been fed with just a few loaves and fish, they just got to the sign, and when Jesus left, they ran around the lake, and they came to him the next day and went, yeah, what are we having for lunch? You're going to be multiplying anything today? Maybe you could do cheesecake. You know, we like the cheesecake. 
So they, got, they, 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 never, they never got past the physical gain of his blessing to who he was. In John chapter 9, the blind man totally believed because his eyes were blind and now he saw. The religious folks never believed, yet they saw the same sign. If we only seek his miracles, and never, it never brings us to know him, we're like these Galileans. We miss out on the life he comes to bring. So indirectly, there in John 4, he challenges this ruler who is genuine in his desire to see God work by speaking to the hearts of the people and saying, you're sign seekers, you should be God seekers, and the signs that you've been given should bring you to a faith now in him, in me, as the case would be. Fortunately, this man was listening. He said to Jesus, oh Lord, if you don't come, my son dies. And Jesus said, you go home, your son is well. You go home, your son lives. And he went home the next day. So how didn't he run right home to see? Because he believed. That's what God's looking for from you and I. You know, there's only one generation that got to look Jesus in the eye and go, that's him, now he's gone. The rest of us have to just believe. Blessed are those who believe. Jesus will say to Thomas in a minute, blessed are those who have not seen, yet they believe. Because it's faith that he longs for. But not just blind faith, faith based on substance, on reason, on proof, on assurance. So Thomas came willing to learn. He was told the evidence. He was called to let his unbelief go. He was, he was reprimanded to cling to faith based on the evidence. So be honest with your doubts. Don't isolate yourself. Be, be willing to be taught. Examine the evidence. And thirdly, finally, this. When you have the information, respond with active faith. In other words, take and run with it and make it a part of your life. Verse 28, Thomas answers and he says, My Lord, my God. And Jesus said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who've not seen, and yet they have believed. Look, Thomas's eyes and ears proved enough for him. I don't think he went and stuck his finger in Jesus' hand. Now, this is the last confession of others about Jesus found in the Gospel of John. There's quite a few of them. I think this might be the most dramatic, because Thomas said, you're my Lord, you're my God. Not you're our God, or you're not God, just in a group. Thomas took this personal. This was a personal um, conversion, if you will, right? Like all of ours are. John the Baptist testified back in chapter 1, this is Jesus, the Son of God. And Nathaniel said, Rabbi, you're the Son of God, the, the King of Israel. And the Samaritan says, you're the Savior of the world. And the, the man born blind said, if, if you weren't of, of God, you, you could do nothing. And then later he worshipped him as the Son of God. Martha said, I believe that you're the Christ, the son of the living God who came into the world. The disciples at the Last Supper says, this makes us believe you've come from God. But, but here's Thomas, one-on-one, -on -one, <laughs> in his doubt. God calls all of us to believe in his son, to look at the death of his son, to look at the empty tomb, to see the fulfillment of the scriptures and prophecy that, that, that is to the, to the T fulfilled thousands of years later. Sometimes a person's name, sometimes a specific event, a birth of the Messiah to a specific, a specific place to a virgin at no less, so that we might not just have blind faith, but we might go, look at the evidence of faith. Blessed are those who have not seen, which is most of us, and yet believe. Well, Thomas came to believe because he saw the Lord and Jesus pronounced the blessing upon us who have not. Sometimes people say, man, I wish I was there. Well, you're not deprived by not seeing him physically. You're, you're, you're the receptor of, of, of a blessing <laughs> because you have the evidence and, and, and you're pleasing the Lord. You're faithful to him. Well, John ends by saying, and it's an appropriate place to put it, Jesus did a lot of other signs in the presence of his disciples, not written in this book, but I've written these down that you might believe. You see, that's the issue, right? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in him, you might have life in his name. So John's comment to Jesus' words to Thomas, bring him to, to make the summary. This is the exact reason I've written. Now, there are only 36 miracles in the Gospels. I know you think there's more, there's not. And John only picked seven of them to highlight, to build his case around you believing in, in the Lord. By the time he wrote every other book except the books he would write were in wide circulation already. They were finished. There is an eighth miracle at the end of, of John's gospel where Jesus puts Malchus's ear back on his head, remember, in the garden. 
But, but he doesn't really build a case around it. He doesn't have a sermon attached to it or a lesson. So it, it, it's the one that he mentions in passing. But the other seven, he builds you know, around them arguments so that you might have faith in him. The, the water turned to wine in, in, in John 2. The healing of the royal official son that we just mentioned in John 4. The healing of the lame man at the Bethesda pool in John 5. The feeding of the 5,000 in John 6. Or the walking on the, on the water also in John 6. Or the man born blind in John 9. Or the raising of Lazarus in John 11. John says, man, there were a lot more, but, but I think these should suffice so that you have evidence for your faith. Blessed are those who, having not seen, have believed. If you ever have someone say to you, what's the Gospel of John about? You just say this, John wrote to make a believer out of me. And if you read the words, it is finished at Calvary, and then you follow the line, Mary Magdalene and the women and Peter and the disciples and even Thomas' life will be changed. He's called a twin in verse 24. In fact, most of the time, when you read about Thomas, they say, yeah, the twin. I don't know if his other twin was a rotten person they didn't want to mention or what, but he's never mentioned, just a twin. And I always like when the Lord leaves unnamed people attached to folks throughout the scripture. I always think it's, you know, maybe it's us that is the twin, you know? We doubt and we struggle. We want answers. We need to learn. We're kind of stubborn. We can be despondent, but we have to learn to act in faith, too. So the Lord is knocking. All you have to do is open the door. If not, you're going to die in your sins. But if you'll open the door, every question you have, God can answer. And you'll have life to boot. Father, thank you this morning that we are um, loved by you more than we could ever understand. And that, Father, like Thomas, we too struggle with knowing why and what, and, and I know that for all of us we have a whole book filled with unanswered questions. But Father, may we not lose sight of what we have learned and what we do know and what you have taught us and what we are sure of. And may we not find ourselves isolated from everyone else because there are things we need to work out. May we instead be willing to learn, be honest with what we want to know, and yet be willing to embrace the truth once we learn it. Because that dispels doubt, certainly. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by your word. You might be in church this morning and you don't know Jesus personally at all. Like Thomas, that's what he wants. He wants to call you personally. Come to me. You have life. Believe in me and I'll in no wise cast you out. Just come. And the Lord would say that to you this morning. Come to the, to the cross and to the empty tomb to where Jesus paid the price for your, your sins he died and where he rose to give you new life, even though you didn't deserve it, you get it from him because he died in your spot, in your place. You could be saved because of the cross and because of the tomb. If you have questions, come and talk to the pastors. They, they, they spend a lot of time in the Bible. They may very well be able to help you kind of sort some things out. It's, it's worth asking. Check it out. I know the Lord has answers, so you can come pray. But make, make it known. <laughs> speak up. Speak out. Because doubts can consume you if you don't look for answers and are willing to embrace the evidence. The truth is there. God has given it to us for life. Does he explain everything? No. But the things he doesn't explain have nothing to do with your eternal life. That's very clear. So you come. And if you don't know Jesus, you come. And we'll pray with you today that Jesus will come into your heart and he will come in, he's promised, to forgive those who call upon his name. Shall we stand?